This is part two of my lecture based on Gapinski's chapter 17, uh, Financial Condition Analysis. So the first couple of ratios we're going to look at for profitability uh, measures are return on assets, ROA, and return on equity, or ROE. Um, you could also think of ROE as ROI uh, in the appropriate uh, uh, context. So ROA takes and combines things from two of our two of our financial statements. It takes net income from our income statement, and it takes total assets from our balance sheet. And basically, it's asking, you've got this stuff, right? In this case, in a hospital with all its its associated equipment. How much? Uh, what percent of the assets did you earn? in income this year, right? So net income was 8.5 million, you have $151 million worth of, of assets. How much income did you earn relative to the assets you had control over? Uh, and in this case, that's 5.7%. Return on equity asks a very similar question, but you have to be careful about what you've got in the denominator. Here we have how much net income did you earn relative to the total amount of equity that is actually invested in the organization. And this would be, equity would be net assets if this was a non, uh, not-for-profit entity. So not-for-profit hospital, this, that, that denominator number, right? Total equity would actually be net assets. So the difference here is you have to remember what is, what's the difference between total assets and total equity. Well, the difference is total liabilities, right? So total assets is all of the stuff owned by the organization, right? So we're asking how efficient are you in terms of generating income with all the stuff that we as investors have given you management? And, um, and then net income relative to total equity is really a question of, okay, with respect to the amount of resources that we, the investors, have invested in this organization, how efficient are you uh, at generating a return? And if this is a not-for-profit, you can replace investors with the community at large uh, or some other appropriate, you know, kind of uh, notional entity that the board of trustees represents uh, when they, when they uh, talk to management. Um, so if this is a, a, a not-for-profit, total equity, meaning the net assets, would represent the assets that have been invested by the community uh, in, this, in this organization. Oh. So you can, as you note here, by almost by definition, ROA is going to exceed, is going to be smaller than ROE because Unless you are 100% equity financed, total equity is going to be less than total assets. And um, there are almost no kind of complex organizations that have zero liabilities, right? Just think about, uh, you know, our current liabilities like, uh, you know, accrued payroll and um, uh, uh, financing that we're receiving from our creditors. So, uh, uh, accounts payable, uh, and, and all those kind of, you know, uh, uh, never mind long-term loans. And so, uh, so it's almost never true uh, that, that ROA is equal to ROE. It could technically be true if total equity was, if, if an organization was 100% uh, uh, equity financed. But in reality, there are almost no complex organizations that are 100% uh, total equ just equity financed. And so in, uh, in pretty much, uh, except in a very theoretical kind of situation, you're going to see ROA is less than ROE. And remember, this is, uh, you know, go, again, this goes to that whole question of financing and capital structure versus, you know, actual assets. So if you picture, you're walking down the street, and you look at a nice looking house, and you pull it up on Zillow, and it says, hey, that house is $500,000. Well, that's the asset value of the house, but it doesn't tell you anything about the capital structure or, you know, the people who live in that house, how big of a mortgage do they have, right? And the bigger that mortgage is, 
the smaller their total equity number is going to be. Um, and if you look at it as like a, a, I don't know, if they were running a business out of it, you could say, well, the total income, you know, if we have a constant total income, you know, the bigger your mortgage is, uh, then the smaller your total equity is so that that denominator gets smaller and smaller, right? So the way that an organization can, can jack up its ROE is by taking out loans, right? So organizations that have a, a high ROE relative to their ROA, um, uh, it could be that they have a large, uh, a, a, a higher debt ratio than other organizations like them. So you have to be careful. This are basically ROA and ROE are basically two ways of looking at um, return on uh, investment, right? Total assets is looking at, uh, you know, return on this kind of overall picture of things that have been purchased to, to uh, create uh, healthcare, if it's a hospital or some other healthcare organization. ROE is looking at the investment, the, in, the invested capital uh, by uh, uh, owners, right? And even if this is not for profit, then it's like these no, nominal owners, the community, right? Um, and again, you can, you can increase your ROE by increasing your debt ratio, by reducing, uh, by increasing the amount of, of financial leverage you have, by increasing the amount of, of debt you take on, uh, and reducing the relative amount of equity that you have on your balance sheet. So it doesn't necessarily, having a high ROE relative to your ROA doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing a good thing. So looking at a couple of different ratios, uh, we have TM stands for total margin, right, or total or profit margin. OM stands for operating margin. And then you have ROA and ROE here. And so uh, here are four ratios, and we have both a trend analysis because we have change over time comparing itself to itself, as well as a comparison analysis because we have an industry average. And so we look at total margin, and if we assume 5% is accurate, which I think it's a little low, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, we say, okay, total margin doing a trend analysis, total margin, this organization has increased its total margin from 2.2 to 7.3. Well, that's good. Um, and then we say, well, relative to the industry average, well, in 14, they were doing worse. In 15, they're doing better. Um, so management, we'd like to see you going into 16 and 17 and so forth. Stay up above that 5% amount. Looking at the operating margin, we have a situation where they've increased slightly from 2.8 to 3, so that's good, right? So trend analysis, that's a, that's a thumbs up. But then we look at uh, the comparison to the industry average, and it's 3.6%. So 14 and 15, they were both years, the operating margin was below industry average. So at this point, we've got to ask management, hey, what's going on there? You know, like you're doing okay with your total, man total margin, um, but your operating margin is low. Well, what does that tell you as, you know, you as an analyst? Well, you're looking here and you're saying, okay, they're operating, their core operating business is not doing as well as the industry, you know, average, which is, you know, concerning, um, but their total margin is up. So that means that they've got some non-operating gains that are feeding in there to make this, uh, the total margin look better. A lot of hospitals, um, these days have situations like this where maybe the operating margin isn't as good as it ought to be or ideally would be, but the, the total margin is being buoyed, as I mentioned in the last lecture, by the fact that we've had a bull market for, you know, going on a decade now. And, you know, if you have an, an organization with a large endowment, uh, that endowment is throwing, you know, lots of investments, that investment, those investments are, are doing well and making it look like your organization is probably healthier than it actually is. So now we look at, so those, but total margin and operating margin come strictly from the income statement. Now we look at the return on assets and return on equity, which is a combination of the income statement and the balance sheet. And again, we can see uh, 2014, the organization was below industry average, which isn't surprising because total margin is based on net income right? As opposed to operating income and ROA and ROE are both based on uh, net income. 
Uh, and so you'd expect to see a similar pattern from total margin carry over to ROA and ROE. Uh, and you can see again, the amplif amplification effect that the fact that ROE is based only on equity, whereas ROA is based on total assets, right? Because that denominator is smaller for ROE than it is for ROA. ROA includes equity, but also uh, liabilities, making it a larger denominator than ROE has. So here we see um, they're doing okay in terms of ROA, right? In 15, they recovered from 14. They're doing better than the industry average in ROA. But even uh, with the uh, with a higher than average ROA, when we look at their ROE, um, they have uh, uh, a below industry average ROE. So that would be concerning. So looking at a couple of short term, so those are kind of longer term profitability margins, right? Or, or well, a bigger picture, I should say, profitability profitability margins. Uh, profitability ratios, excuse me, uh, not longer term. They're actually short term. Uh, uh, looking at, but they're bigger picture. Looking at liquidity ratios, now what we want to know about is, okay, does this organization have the ability to pay its bills? And the most basic uh, question would be the current ratio, right, CR, which, which is current assets, right, divided by current liabilities. And so in this case, uh, this organization has 31,280 in current assets, well, I guess 31 million, and 13 million in current liabilities. So current assets are things that we can convert into cash or expect to convert into cash or use within a year. Current liabilities are things we're expecting to have to pay within a year. And so they have 2.3 uh, times as many asset, current assets as current liabilities, or another way of looking at it is, they have $2.30 in relatively liquid assets to cover every dollar of expected liabilities that they have coming up. So that's a pretty good number. Days cash on hand is a really important measure um, because it really te it tells you how many days can I stay in operation? How many days of bills can I pay um, with the cash that I currently have? And so we go to the balance sheet here and we grab the cash number as well as the short-term investments because the idea is even though short-term investments aren't cash per se because you can't just write a check off of them, they can be converted into cash relatively easily. Uh, and so we put those two together, those two things together as our cash. Uh, and then we say, it, we look at in our denominator, cash, ex, uh, ca cash expenses are are. Our, our total expenses minus our depreciation. So you can see the formula down here, right? Because depreciation, so we go, to the, we go to the income statement and we take the operating expenses, right? The operating expense portion of the balance sheet, that middle, one thir that middle third portion of the income statement. And then we uh, lop off depreciation from it, right? Or in a sense, add back, you know, the, the expense of depreciation. Um, because appreciation is not actually a cash expense. Uh, it's a, it's a, a economic value, right? And we divide that by 365. So we take the, the amount of money we're spending each year um, adjusted for depreciation. We divide it by 365 to come up with an amount of money we spend each day. And then we use that as the denominator. So we say, well, how much money do we have on hand? And we divide it by the amount of money we spend each day. And that gives us how many days cash on hand we have. And so you don't want this number to go too low and you want your industry, you know, um, average, which is about 31 days. Uh, you want to be at or above that amount. Um, you know, so be, if, and if you're not, uh, your lenders can get a bit antsy about, you know, whether you're going to be able to pay your bills or not. Having 21.8 days would be of some significant concern to lenders. And you might even violate your, um, uh, bond covenants, meaning, you know, you could be in technical default. So uh, doing a um, uh, comparison across time, uh, the organization is doing a little better than it was, right? The industry average is two, so they were below, now they're above. So that's good. We want to stay above. Days cash on hand, 
we're, we're improving, but we're still way below industry average. So here I'd be concerned uh, if I was a board member um, because I would be concerned that my, the lenders, if, they, if, we had bond, if we had bonds outstanding, I'd be concerned that we might violate our bond covenants. So go back to, I believe it's uh, chapter um, uh, 11, you know, on bonds. We talk about, you know, the different covenants, um, but that could be a concern. So our next ratio is debt management ratio. So we've talked about debt ratio and I was mentioning it just a minute ago. Um, and I was saying, well, you know, one of the reasons that maybe our ROE is lower than average is it could be that our debt ratio is lower than average, right? We're using more equity uh, than the average, uh, in this case, hospital uh, uses. And so we look at our debt ratio, which says how much debt um, do we have relative to our assets? Well, remember, uh, total assets is total debt plus equity. Well, um, if we have 29% debt, then we have 71% equity. And our, um, if, the average, uh, if the industry average is 43% uh, debt, and we're carrying 29% debt, then we're more equity uh, financed than other uh, organizations like us are. And that means that our ROE is going to be lower by definition, right? Because our equity is going to be higher than other entities. Let me skip back here. So here we found out that our ROE was eight, or 2.48, which is lower than the industry average. But our total equity is higher than the industry average relative to our total assets. And so you would expect to see that number, that 107,000 number be lower. Right? This represents um, only 29% debt financing or 71% equity financing. We ought to be somewhere around you know, 57, 58% uh, um, uh, equity financed rather than 71% equity financed. And so that number ought to be, if we were in line with industry average, that number ought to be lower. And so one question to ask is, you know, are we using our, our ability to carry debt appropriately because that ROE would be higher just by changing our capital structure? Uh, times interest earned is, asks, do we have enough money uh, to cover our uh, interest uh, on you know on our on our loans, and given that we have a relatively low um, debt ratio, you would expect that to be true, uh, and indeed it is in this case you know in the in this particular case um, very often uh, you know it, it, uh, debt long term debt is dangerous in that um, it results in a fixed cost that the organization has to pay all the time. There's no getting out of it unless you find a way to pay off the debt. And that's often very difficult. So this is, you know, taking on debt is a bit of a deal with the devil uh, in that, um, you know, the, the bondholders uh, as sympathetic to the mission of your organization, they might be, uh, they also expect to actually get their, you know, get their coupon payments. Um, so uh, times earned, times interest earned, the EBIT, uh, earnings before interest and taxes uh, is a common phrase used in finance. Um, EBIT uh, is is really focused on uh, operating income. Uh, with healthcare, interest is plugged into the expenses typically on the income statement. So you add that back to to your to your. Um, uh, uh, to your income, uh, excuse me, to your, to get your EBIT. Um, and then we get uh, 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 this, this, this measure of kind of how much money are we bringing in from the operating side? And is it a, is it a good, um, you know, a healthy amount relative to what we're going to be called on to pay uh, our lenders? And so for these two, uh, these two, you know, uh, particular measures, Debt ratio, like I said, we're a little low, or this this organization is a little low, and they, and they're going lower. They've been, and it, as we talked about in the first uh, section of this lecture, they appear to have paid off 
a bunch of their long-term debt for whatever reason uh, and, and reduce. So from 14 to 15, they went from 33 to 29, right? The industry average is 43. And so, you know, a question, you know, is this a strategic decision? Is there a reason why uh, they're trying to deleverage and be more, uh, be more equity financed? And maybe there's a good reason there. Um, the, the times interest earned measure is significantly above. And that makes sense, like I said, because they've reduced the amount of debt. And in particular, they've gone from 2.6 to 6.6. So they've jumped from being, you know, in a dangerous level to being in a healthy, you know, perhaps even too high level uh, over the course of one year. Next couple of, of uh, measures are asset management measure uh, ratios. And these are similar to the return on assets uh, that we talked about a, a, a minute ago, except instead of using net income, we're talking about revenue generated. And so FA is fixed asset turnover. So fixed assets refer to your, your property, plant, and equipment. In other words, like your building, all your, you know, your, your MRI machines and your, you know, all, all your laboratory equipment, all that stuff. So you've got all this stuff. How many, how much revenue do you, revenue do you earn given all the stuff that you have, right? Um, and so this is focused on revenue, right? Not net income. So that's the difference between, uh, between these ratios and, you know, the return on assets measures plus fixed assets focuses only on the fixed assets and not you know, other assets, current assets, your um, uh, uh, long-term investments and all those things, right? This is really just looking at your, literally your stuff, right? Your physical stuff you can touch. Um, and so the idea here is a higher, a higher ratio is generally better. And you should have a sense of that. I guess I should have been saying this all along. Obviously, a higher ratio is better. You know, a higher ratio would imply you've got this stuff and you you generate more revenue with, with this stuff relative to, you know, a comparison organization that has maybe the same amount of stuff, but doesn't generate as much revenue with it. Now, this is going to vary from, from uh, industry to industry. Hospitals have a, you know, have a fairly high amount of fixed assets. Nursing homes would have an even higher uh, amount of fixed assets. Um, and whereas, you know, law practices have a, relatively low amount of fixed assets, right? They, you know, law office, basically, you know, some people with some paper and computers, um, right? As opposed to a hospital has all this really expensive equipment. Uh, total asset turnover, TA turnover, uh, plugs in now total assets in the denominator. So that's your net fixed assets plus uh, all your other assets, right? So this is that total asset number at the bottom of the, the left side of the balance sheet. And it's just looking at total revenues generated for all the assets. We don't care which kind they are. Um, and again, more, you know, higher is better. Uh, higher shows a more efficient use of assets. And again, same as with the fixed asset turnover, it's industry specific. Different industries are going to have, you know, what's good is going to vary from industry to industry. Um, this last one, uh, I don't even know how to say it, DIPAR, I, we don't use it that way. Uh, uh, days, in, days in accounts receivable uh, or days in patient accounts receivable um, is your, uh, so you hear you say, okay, how much your denominator is uh, net patient services revenue divided by 365. So what you're, what you're looking at is how much net patient service revenue do I bring in every day? Okay, once I know that, um, how many, if I divide my net patient accounts receivable, my accounts receivable by that number, that will tell me how many days of, you know, daily amounts that I earn are in my accounts receivable. And so this is one of those situations where a lower is better because a lower number indicates your revenue cycle people are really good at uh, cleaning up your accounts receivable. So uh, you want a lower number here, right? Going back, you know, these are all you want higher numbers. Um, so a comparison across for our, our, our little organization. So we're, we're looking at, you know, uh, comparison across time. Uh, they are, 
improving their fixed asset turnover. They're improving their total asset turnover, so that's good. Uh, but they are below industry average in both, right? Both fixed asset and total asset turnover, uh, which doesn't speak highly of management. Uh, you know, given what we know about it, that would be a concern, right? I mean, all these indicators, ROA, um, you know, uh, is okay, uh, but other measures are a little weak, especially these asset turnovers. So, you know, chances are the ROA is okay because they've got uh, some other uh, source of revenue coming in, namely uh, non-operating uh, uh, gains that are that are kind of covering up for uh, the fact that their operations are not as strong as they ought to be. So, you know, these measures are, you know, reveal some problems in that organization. And that's consistent with our, you know, our observation about their total margin versus their operating margin. Uh, days days uh, in accounts, sorry, days in patient accounts receivable, uh, they're a little high. So this is one where you want to be low, right? So they want, you want to be below 64, not above 64. Uh, so they're not doing a great job collecting uh, cash on the things that they're owed. All right. DuPont analysis. This sounds more complicated than it is, but it's really just four ratios. And they're ratios, for the most part, that we've already talked about. Uh, the equity multiplier is a bit of a twist on, um, uh, on, on the debt ratio. So uh, the DuPont analysis brings together, like I said, four uh, related uh, ratios. Um, the outcome is ROE, but it can, but ROE can be kind of decomposed into three other uh, ratios, mar total margin, total asset turnover, and like I said, the equity multiplier, which is really uh, debt, the, a, a kind of an inverted debt ratio. So looking at it again, uh, total margin, total asset, turnover, total equity multiplier, ROE, of course, is net income over equity, right? So total margin, net income divided by revenue, uh, total asset turnover is revenue over total assets. So these, of course, cancel and you're left with net income uh, divided by total assets. And then with the equity multiplier, the equity multiplier is, is simply total assets divided by total equity. Well, then you have uh, total assets cancel out and you have net income divided by total equity, which is ROE. So <clears throat> uh, as we already observed, uh, ROE uh, for our notional entity here was 2.4. I think they had it rounded to eight uh, in the earlier slide. Uh, but the industry average is 8.39. But it also gives us a, a, you know, a breakout of each of these uh, by uh, industry comparison. So total margin, right? They were worse in 14, but better in 15. Uh, the industry average is, is five. So uh, worse, worse than the industry average in 14, better in 15, trending upwards. So that's good. Um, their total asset turnover was below uh, uh, the industry average in both years, though it did in fact improve a bit. Um, and then the equity multiplier was lower than the industry average, which makes sense based on what we've already discussed about the fact that their debt ratio is low. And if you remember that, you know, uh, if you have an equity multiplier, you could essentially have a, a debt multiplier, right? And if you invert both of them, you wind up with the debt ratio. And this would be the equity, equity ratio, if you will. Um, and so they've got, because these numbers are lower, uh, what that's telling you is they have more equity um, relative, you know, their, their, their total assets are financed more by equity than the industry average. And frankly, they're, they're just getting, because they paid off some of their debt, they're actually um, uh, increasing the amount of equity they have uh, or decreasing the amount of uh, debt. And so, um, so that's a, you know, that's, that's, that is a, you know, that may in fact be a strategic, you know, if this was a real organization, of course, that may in fact be a strategic decision. Um, but, you know, kind of all other things being equal, 
we'd have to ask ourselves, why, are, why aren't we making better use of the fact that we should be able to borrow and that would increase our um, return on equity? So what does that all mean? Well, um, uh, it helps us you know, look at uh, the entity. It, it's a useful kind of combination of, um, uh, a useful combination of, of uh, ratios that help us look at different elements of, you know, different aspects of the organization. How profitable is it? How well are they using the resources they have? And how, uh, and what is their capital structure like? And so that actually is a pretty good snapshot, right? Um, in a sense, it's a, it's a nice set of, of key um, indicators uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit. So some other techniques that, that, I'm a fan of, in particular, I really like, um, I, I actually I like both of these, and I'm going to have a separate video walking through uh, and analyzing an income statement and a balance sheet that I will post separately, and then I'll put the links uh, in, uh, to them in these videos. But common size analysis um, of the income statement and balance sheet allows you to kind of express um, all the lines of both your income statement and balance sheet uh, as a percentage, and so it kind of gives you, uh, it gives you kind of uh, like a like a body fat analysis of an organization. You say like, okay, we're, we are, I'm 100% me, but I'm you know 27% fat and 40% muscle, right? And, and so the common size analysis allows you to do that with an organization, uh, both the income statement and the balance sheet, and it's useful because you can kind of get that compositional. Uh, analysis. Uh, and it's a little too complicated just kind of talk it through. So I'd recommend if you're not familiar with it, I'll, like I said, I'll post a link uh, to, my, to my video about that in, in the same folder. Uh, and then the percentage change analysis or year over year, you know, this is really critical because this is so, you know, it, it allows you to, um, you know, compare uh, how you've changed over time. Um, and I, you know, I think it's useful to look at, you know, like absolute dollar change, like, okay, we had $5 million in revenue last year, and we have $5.2 million this year. So we have a $2 million, a $0.2 million increase or $200,000 increase. But it's more meaningful to talk about a percentage, right? And so it's just useful to change all those absolute numbers into percentages, because um, sometimes a relatively small uh, uh, dollar change can represent a large percentage change and that might not pop out at you if you're simply looking at uh, dollar changes over time. And so both common size and percentage change analysis are really useful tools for doing an initial analysis of um, an income statement or a balance sheet. So that concludes part two of this lecture and we'll come back in a, uh, and do part three, which will close out the lecture on chapter 17 from Gapinski's financial uh, uh, healthcare finance.